Hi, I'm Kathy O'Neill, and I'm going to be telling some stories today. Uh, my st series of stories is called, And the World Went On Without Me, because that's kind of how it feels this year. Um, it's just been a really tough year. Um, so I aim to bring a little bit of light and joy to the day, to IBAM. But um, what I like to do is I tell stories about growing up in New Jersey in the 70s and 80s, and about being Irish Catholic and issues of identity and um, dealing with nuns and authority and just having a little bit of fun. So my first uh, piece is called The Bakery. Living above a bakery? Oh yeah, you like that, don't you? Well, I did. It was called Marker's Bakery and it was downstairs from our apartment. And the bakery was mid-size and it had all the staples you would find in a bakery. It had cakes that were shaped like crucifix. They had cupcakes, they had brownies, eclairs, powdered rolls, donuts, and more donuts. And I love to live above a bakery. I was four. I thought I was Willy Wonka. Hi, little girl, they'd say. What's your name? I'm Kathy and I live upstairs from a bakery. We were destitute and my mother worked at the bakery. So in essence, I worked there too. We got some free cookies, some crawlers, and some day old bread. I was like the artful dodger. We ate junk and that's what poor people did. We never got fat. It was magical. One day the staff decided to thank the garbage man who came once a week and picked up the three day old rolls. And these were the rolls that even we didn't want. And they left a cake for him. And the cake was majestic. It was a yellow cake and it was chocolate with vanilla swirls and it looked like outer space. And I was hanging out around the bakery talking shop with the head baker. My ears perked up. There's a cake? Where? I moved behind a milk display and I listened in. The cake would be left on the wooden stairs behind the other stairs that led to the back of the bakery that led to our apartment. Wait, they were going to leave a cake out on a stairs? Not even in a box? Sitting out? I didn't know the ins and outs of the baked goods world. I didn't know the rules or the hierarchy of the bakery scene, the culture, who knows. But I wanted in because back then kids had a looser leash. You could essentially hitchhike the bar still and no one would care. Wear a sweater, they yell as I ran in front of traffic. I snuck out back, I, undetect I was undetected and I saw it, the cake. It was fantastic. I circled the cake. I knew it was wrong and I dove in with my hands. I dove in with my whole body. I was like a stripper jumping into a cake. And the cake was all over me. I was, kept eating and I was covered in sugar. And my hair was all frosted now, stuck up in devil's horns. The staff ran out and saw me. What are you doing? The Greek chorus of mom and Helen and what's her name yelled. I looked up, covered in head to toe in confectioner's sugar. It was carnage. Hi, mommy, you look pretty. I stalled for time and I wiped my chin and I glanced around sketchily looking for some milk. It didn't work. They were mad and they hadn't fallen for my childlike wonder or my impish charms. I slunk off and I never looked back. The life of crime is for me. You know, I really don't like nuns. I really don't like nuns and to be honest, I don't really think they care much for me. Those nuns at Our Lady of Lords near the Torn Hat Bar in the deli in West Orange, New Jersey, they are very, very, very bad people. Nuns are bad people. Not fun nuns, not nuns on the run in wacky sneakers, not sassy nuns who sing in hand clapping choirs like Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act or Sister Act Two, Back to the Habit. No, not like those nuns at all. These nuns called me Kathleen and they pulled my hair and they made me deliver an oral report on Ulysses S. Grant. You know, don't get me wrong, I love Ulysses S. Grant, but I was eight, come on. These nuns, they would get in fist fights with students, they would throw chalk at a five-year-old and they would tell me that God didn't love me and would punish me. Maybe so, but remember, I am eight. These nuns, Sister Patricia Jasinski, or Jazzy as we call her, I don't care if you think I'm not a proper lady or that enough is enough or that boys will be boys. Where did you learn this crap at a nun speak for dummies book? So I shoved a kid during kickball. It hid in the cloakroom during a spelling test and I put a dead mouse on the convent stairs. I mean, it was dead already. So listen up, do not ever come to my house and tell my mother that I am bad news. Could you not have just sent a note? So you nuns, you heed my warning someday and not today because today is Sunday and I know you're working but I will get you when I'm not so scared. And I'm just saying, just don't really like nuns. 
I was asked to be a part of the 1982 West Orange, New Jersey, Our Lady of Lords May Crowning Court. We, I didn't know what it was or what its responsibilities were, but I thought it might come with a sash. And I was 13 and I had nothing else going on. I didn't even know what a May Crowning was. Maybe there would be a reception to follow and I give good reception. I was very high profile at my school, not so popular as infamous. I had come in fourth in the state spelling bee and I was good enough at sports that I didn't get picked last or even seventh in gym class. Get picked last? There's a lot of well-paid therapists out there making money off the kids who got picked last in gym, but not me. So I said yes to the May Crown in court. It would look good, they said, wondering who they were and where would it look good. If it was to get me out of algebra for a few hours, I would ride on a float if I had to. It never occurred to me to ask about my duties. I would just go with the flow. I was an athlete, a spelling bee champion, and a winner of so many president's fitness tests for fast running and girls sit-ups. One of the nuns, Sister Dorothy or Sister Helen or Sister Rigamortis, say she told me I had a duty and it was an awesome responsibility to represent our school. And I nodded and I waved her away, fiddling with some ropey friendship bracelet on my wrist. Uh-huh, I muttered. Awesome, duty, responsibility, God, community, USA, American flag. You know what? I got this, sister. I got this. It was eighth grade. It was May. I had mentally checked out of Our Lady of Lords Catholic School back in December. I was ready for public high school where I could wear jeans and have a locker. No oppressive rules, no Catholic Schools Week, no Dorothy Hamill hairdo. Really, I had no interest in this ceremony, the pageantry, the charade. It didn't even seem like there would be boys there or they'd have appetizers. No DJ, no camera crew. What's your overhead? What are your expectations? Is there a VIP list? Can I invite friends? And so the job, it came with duties. We would process to a grotto or something to a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary and we would crown her with plastic flowers. And people came to see this why? I don't know. And the crown, it was slightly dusty and it was sitting in an AV closet all year with a projector and a movie about getting your period. I could not get excited about this lackluster event and I told no one. My mother would have thought I was lying anyway. She was suspicious of me and she kept her door locked at night. I still think she doesn't understand why I am not in jail. So I started thinking about this half-assed production would look on my resume, on my transcripts. You think now I can even put this on LinkedIn? So we prepared to process and commence, look holy and look humble. And this does not come easy to me. I wanted to work for Rolling Stone magazine. Humility, humility, that's for girls named Patricia. I was going places that did not involve grottos or plastic flowers. I was going to London, maybe Spain, maybe California, or even Bourbon Street someday when I wasn't 13. The rest of the main crown in court seemed politically stacked. There were girls that the nuns liked whose parents took up the gifts at mass or were Eucharistic ministers. There were girls who were more, even more Catholic and more Irish than me. There was Kath and Kathleen and me, Kathy, and Nancy. And Nancy acted like an Astor or a Kennedy because her father was an orthodontist. And another girl, what was her name? I don't know, I'll just call her Dull. And Kathleen had the biggest clout and she would do the actual May crowning herself. Her parents were active in the church and they gave more money than me because we were poor. And that's why my mom sat in the back of the church and kept her coat on. She was a single mom. And my dad was absent. And my mother bagged groceries at the shop right. So why choose a three-time loser like me? I don't know, for the scandal. The lack of interest in the pageantry of a main crowning, the lack of understanding of its importance of the ceremony, and my inability to stay out of trouble did me in. I did something wrong. I was bold, I was brazen, I was disrespectful, and I was brash. I was a girl. So they tossed me out. Again, boys will be boys, but girls get removed from the May count in court. I was told that I was not welcome in the court anymore. Maybe it was the spitball thrown at the priest who ignored all the girls. Maybe it was hiding in the closet during the spelling bee and whispering my teacher's name over and over and over. She was about five minutes away from being involuntarily committed for exhaustion. Who knows? That was like a thousand years ago and I have been kicked out of so many, so many better places than that. But I sabotaged it. I would no longer be crowning or knighting or whatever duties they were that they had that they told me but that I forgot because I hadn't listened. I pretended to be hurt and I rubbed my eyes while eyeing the clock to see how many more seconds it would be before I burned this school to embers. 
Two days out, I was asked back, not to crown or to process, but to leave the school in the rosary over the public address system. Wow, me, really? I had not been that excited since I'd gotten my scoliosis test. The whole school would recite it as the court made their way to the grotto, and we would lead it. Huh, somebody else calling sick? I said yes, quite honestly, because it would kill two hours of my time and June could not come fast enough. I was to share the duties with Leslie, who was neither rich nor rich looking. She was, well, she was me. We had a mic, we had a microphone and we were to volley the Hail Marys. Warming up, we had a giggle fit because this was kind of silly. And the major dormo nun hovered, sweating and getting angrier and angrier. She had turned a more low color. She was seething, she was writhing and she was stewing. She thought we were going to ruin it. And when the ceremony began, we were given the three, two, and we began the rosary in clear, unwavering voices, strong voices, solid, with nary a flicker of doubt. I am a war course, and I knew what needed to be done. When it was over, I lingered by the grotto, and I caught some May sun on my face. That was lovely, thank you, the principal said, looking to meet my eyes. Whatever, I said over my shoulder and walked off in search of my next big gift. When I would get up to kick from my team during sixth grade gym, they would all back up. It happened immediately. The opposing team would just back up slowly, but in a uniform way, because I was a kickball star. Foot of thunder, fleet of foot, foot insured by Lloyd's of London. They'd back up because I was a fast and strong little tomboy with very long tube socks and expensive sneakers that I purchased with my paper boy earnings, except I was a paper girl. When they back up for you in kickball, you are allowed certain assurances by the Vatican, extra peas by the lunch ladies, and a chance to be vetted by kickball scouts who hit the CYO meetings and pace the asphalt, looking for the next big Tommy McPartland, the world-renowned kickball champion of 1977, now working the pep boys. When they back up for you in kickball, you don't have your lunch stolen. You don't get abused by the priests who prey on only those with no kickball skills. And you might even get a part in the pageant as one of the three kings, the one with the frankincense. Yes, very serious. You step up to the plate, you squint, you look on the horizon, and you generally look cool for effect. You flip your hair back behind your ears, you step back, you run into the red rubber ball and you let it rip. It goes so far, it takes two of them to go get the ball and it hits the car of that guy who wears jean shorts and calls all of his girlfriends, special lady. It soars over the parish and it remains airborne for infinity. The ball zooms past your house, past your sister smoking a cigarette by the church, past your small town, and it lands into the city 20 minutes away. You flick a piece of hair from your eyes and you begin the unnecessary victory lap around the bases, thinking about what's for dinner and kickball scholarships to the University of Delaware. Rounding third, you glance up at the sky and you hold the gaze, considering life's endless possibilities. Thank you and thanks to everyone involved in Celtic Women International and IBAM. It's been a real pleasure to tell you these stories today. Thank you. Thank you.